I don't know why, but I'm covered in glitter. <laughs> Where it all came from. just about now is we're getting ready to hit uh, winter solstice, which will be next Friday. This is the time when the nights start to get shorter again, all the way until June when we hit the summer solstice, but it wasn't always this way. In fact, there was a time when the sun didn't turn around, when it didn't come back the way it does now. The days kept getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And so eventually the days were so short that the people in the village would get up and really early and throw their clothes on, throw their buckskin and get up really early to go greet the sun, to go do their work. But by the time they stepped outside of their huts, the sun was already gone into the west. So they started to get concerned because they couldn't grow their three sisters, the bean, the corn, the squash. They couldn't go hunting. They couldn't do the things that they would normally do. So they asked their helper, their first teacher, Moshap. They said, will you go talk to grandfather's son? because we're getting concerned that the sun hasn't been coming back. And he said, well, let me go see what I can do. Now, where these people live, they lived on the East Coast, and the sun would come up in the water. So he waded all the way out into the water to the sun up, to the, where the sun came up place is what they called it. And he waded far out, and he waited for the sun to come up. And as soon as the sun came up out of the water, he said, Grandfather, son, I'd like to talk to you. If I, if I could, if just a well, moment. And it was gone. Grandfather's son was left. He did that for three days. Grandfather's son, I wanted to, and then the son was gone. So finally, on the third day, he went down to the ocean, to the very bottom of the ocean, and he got all of this kelp and all of this seaweed, and he tied it together in a net, the way he had taught his people to make fishing nets. And so the next day, after he made his beautiful net, well, he saw it starting to get light, and then he saw the sun coming up. And just as the sun, before it came up, he threw the net up, and he got the sun in his net. And the sun says, what's going on here? Who's holding on to me? What is this about? And so Moshap said, Grandfather, son, I'm so sorry to do this to you, but you wouldn't listen to me. Well, what's on your mind? He says, well, we've been kind of concerned because you've been coming up and leaving so quickly we can't do our work. And he proceeded to tell him the whole story of the village and the, and the people. And the son patiently listened and said, hmm, you know, that's kind of funny. In fact, that's kind of peculiar because, you know, I didn't even think any of you people cared about me. You even noticed me, to be honest. And he said, I would, I would get up and you're all asleep. And I would leave, and nobody's greeting me and saying goodbye. And so, I, honestly, I didn't think you appreciated me. So I was going to the other side of the world where they appreciate me. They give me songs, and they write about me, and they talk to me every day and thank me. And he said, oh, okay. So he let the son go. And so he goes back to the village, and he tells him, Grandfather's son told me this about our situation. Well, they were pretty ashamed of themselves. They felt pretty embarrassed because, to be honest, they'd never even considered that the sun had feelings, much less what they might be. So the next time the sun come up, they already had a bonfire going, and they were throwing sacred tobacco out and corn, and they were offering smudge smoke and prayers, and they said, Grandfather, son, we're so glad to see you. How's it going? You know, you look great today. And so, uh, Grandfather, son, oh, I kind of like this. You know, this is kind of nice. I could, okay. And so, Every day they would be up before he came and they would gossip with him and tell him the stories, what the neighbors were, were doing, and they would thank him. And then when he would leave, they'd go put corn pollen and say, thank you. Today was a beautiful day. Thank you for coming. Please come back tomorrow. Same time, <laughs> you know. Um, so the son did kind of like that. And so this went, this went on for some time and, until June. And he started to say, you know, I kind of miss those folks on the other side of the world those folks over there in California. So I'm going to go over there. <laughs> and he said, but don't worry, I'm going to come back. And so they said, oh, okay, well, thank you. Thank you, we understand. And so it's been this way ever since then. 
And the reason is because every day they get up and they say the prayers of thanksgiving and appreciation and they remember the sun. And they tell these stories, not because they're just myths, but stories to remind every other person how much appreciation and gratitude really matters, how much of a difference that it, that it makes. We're, in fact, so dependent on the sun. You know that no life would exist without sunlight. Sunlight hits those little plants out there. It does something called photosynthesis. I don't want to get too technical on you, but, you know, photosynthesis. And then the animals eat it, and we eat those turkeys or whatever. But it also grows everything that we have. It gives us vitamin D. It, um, uh, last week, Bonnie mentioned uh, seasonal affective disorder uh, that, where people don't get quite enough light. And in fact, vitamin D is produced by the sun. So in other words, we're, we're dependent on the sun rising every day. And cultures all around the world have stories about how the day and the night came to be, how the seasons came to be. There was a time when people would go out and, and bang. They would bang on uh, drums, and they would bang on metal, and they would do flutes, and they would dance, calling the, the sun back. Some cultures think that the dragon ate the sun every winter, and so they would try to get it to, to come back out of it. In New Mexico, we shoot guns at Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. <laughs> I don't know why. I think they're trying to shoot the sun or something. I don't know. <laughs> I stay inside, usually. Uh, but... The fact that every creature here on earth is experiencing solstice, experiencing that change of seasons. For us here in New Mexico, we, we, we look when the, the way I know that it's winter is when, is when the pecans start to become ripe. When the pecan leaves finally fall, that's usually the indication of the first frost. So it's time to go out and start to harvest the pecans. I used to live on Shalem Colony Trail, and we had about four, 14 or 16 pecan trees. I don't remember, but... I remember how they would all fall, all the trees. I'd never raked leaves in my life. I'm from New Mexico, but, but we had those leaves and would go out and rake them. Then the pecan shakers would grab the tree and they would shake and all the pecans would come off. And then you would notice it's all barren until, until usually in April when the, the leaves started to, to come back. And so we have an appreciation of the seasons, even here in New Mexico, here, here in the Southwest. And that's one of the reasons I like living in, in this valley because we have, well, we have, I tell people we have two, two seasons, wind and summer, but I think we have a couple of more. <laughs> Sometimes it gets cold. So now we aren't just talking about the physical light, are, are, are we? You know, we're, we're talking more also about light. There are so many disciplines and so many teachers that say that we're actually beings of, of light, that we're creatures of light, that within us is this little spark of the divine that's animating us, that's causing us to, to tell stories, that's causing us to get up every day in that, in that newness. In the, the Seed of the Soul by Gary Zukov, he has a great chapter about light, and this is one of the parts that he says about it. He says, you are a system of light, as are all beings. The frequency of your light depends upon your consciousness. When you shift the level of your consciousness, you shift the frequency of your light. If you choose to forgive someone who's wronged you, for example, rather than to hate that person, you shift the frequency of your light. If you choose to feel, to feel affection or kinship with that person rather than a distance or a coldness, you also shift the frequency of your light. In Living the Science of Mind, which um, Martha read from this, this, this morning, Ernest Holmes, when he talks about light, he has a great passage, and he says, the spirit is both an overdwelling and an indwelling presence. We are immersed in it, and it flows through us as our very life. And through intuition, man perceives and directly reveals God. We do not have to borrow our light from another. Nothing could be more intimate than the personal relationship between the individual and the source of our being. Miriam Williamson, in her book, The Return to Love, in that great passage that everybody quotes, you know, she talks about, um, you know, uh, your hiding your light doesn't serve anyone. It doesn't serve anyone good. You, you don't do anyone any good by pretending that you aren't a child of God, that you aren't a child of the divine, that you aren't here to manifest the greatest glory that you could possibly be, this gift of light that we've been given both as sunlight, but also as an inner light. Ernest Holmes has this other passage in Living the Science of Mind where he says, 
What if you have been lurking in the dark or damp shadows of previous experience until you are so depressed that you don't even know what to do because you're surrounded by darkness? The very moment that you step into the sunshine, you are in that light. Just place yourself in the position so that all shadows will be cast behind you. Listen to that. That is such a great line. Place yourself in the position so that all shadows will be cast behind you. So there will be nothing between you and the sun, and let its warmth and energy fill you with a new will to live. So when I was thinking about what are the spiritual lessons of life, what are the sp of light, what are the spiritual lessons of winter solstice? There are so many, and Bonnie touched on quite a few of them these past two Sundays. And you know, I was thinking as I was hiking out. In, in, in the open space out near where I live and looking at the sunshine and seeing what it's doing. One of the, unfortunately, one of the consequences when the sun shines, you can see how much broken glass is in the desert, but that's another story. Um, but we are at the beneficence of the sun, of Earth's axis, of space, of gravity, of so many factors that we could possibly never create on our own and have no control over. Voyager 2 this past week just crossed into the edge, uh, supposedly, of our galaxy. Is it a galaxy or a solar system? Now I can't remember, because Mars did something too, right? The, the inside probe up there that finally landed. They're gonna find a Starbucks, I just know it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's humbling to think about how many factors are in play that allow us to be here, al allow us to experience each other's wisdom and each other's darkness, each other's light, each other's love. So one of the spiritual lessons that I realize Winter Solstice teaches us is patience. Big one. Because, you know, in some instances in the great north of Albuquerque or wherever it snows up there, they have to hunker down. Have you ever noticed in New Mexico when it snows here, all the milk and bread gets bought up right away? you know, <laughs> or if it rains even. <laughs> so we have this innate sense of hibernating, of, of huddling, of huddling together to get those resources in, to share those resources too with the people who we care about. It takes patience to be out driving around today. I, I live up off Telshore, and so I'm what I call Lomador up there, L L Loman and Telshore, and I tell you, it takes patience lately uh, to go to Target. <laughs> It takes you four or five cycles of the, of the, of the, of the light just, just to get through. But I remind myself to be patient. I remind myself that me being in a, in a hurry is, isn't really going to do any good. So I try to be as patient as I can with other shoppers and with other drivers. And that's what we have to also do during winter solstice. It teaches us patience. Patience with music that seems to start at Valentine's Day now for Christmas music and the custom of our neighbors and our family and our coworkers and people's light displays who you can't stand and with put angels in the, the nativity scenes and the giant snowman. I saw a Smurf snowman the other day. I thought it was pretty cool. So we have to have that patience. And we also have to have that patience with the expectations of what this time of year brings to us. You know, we're always trying to get into that elusive Christmas spirit. Remember when we were kids and we were telling each other, it doesn't feel like Christmas yet, you know, it doesn't feel like Christmas. Well, we used to do that. And, and, and then when the tree would come up, it'd start to feel a little like Christmas. And then I was a Catholic, so we went to midnight mass, and that really felt like Christmas. You know, then when my mother would, my aunts would make tamales, that really felt like Christmas. So, patience. It also teaches us faith. Faith that balance will be restored. Faith that the sun's going to come back. Faith that the seasons are going to be back in rhythm and in cycle. Faith that people still care, will still care about one another and about this planet. It also teaches us renewal, rebirth from dormancy. The New Year's resolution, I think, is the best example of, of, of that. It's our reboot. We, you know, when we, we get to hit the reset button and go, okay, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to meditate every day, yada, yada, yada. We burn candles and flash papers and have ceremonies and try to have things we want to let go of and things we want to manifest for this coming year. And forgive people, too. I don't know why they did that there. Hey. 
renewal can also be physical, but it can also be spiritual. The biggest part I see of that is forgiveness and letting go. Seeing those people we only see once or twice a year, well, what about reaching out to them a little more often? And why do we bring the same emotional baggage to the, that we had last year to the party? We don't have to do that. We don't have to do that. We can, re, we can reconnect. We can forgive, ask forgiveness, even in private meditation or prayer to make, to make new. The term solstice, it actually comes from the Latin word solstitium, solstitium, meaning that the sun stands still. So we can also stand still, can't we? Stand still in appreciation like the people in the story. In appreciation and gratitude, we can stand still in meditation, in community. To begin our wheel again, this time choose the, choosing the path, the path of renewal, of newness. In pagan practice, they see the... Um, solstice as a wheel. That's how they refer to, to a solstice. And so they, they have elaborate ceremonies about restarting that wheel. So this time of year it really invites reflecting, reflection and contemplation. And there's nothing better, in my opinion, than an honest evaluation of where we've grown or where we've not this past year. We can also set that intention for this next cycle. We can do this any day, really, at any moment, any time of the day, but there's something about this season that invites us to that newness, to that reflection. Because things are not as they are, but things are as we see them, right? They're not as they are, but as we see them. I'm going to end with a story about that that's not necessarily a solstice story, but it's... To me, it really demonstrates how our perception and how we see situations are not always the case. There was this psychiatrist and consciousness researcher named Stan Groff, and he tells a story of this time that he was teaching at John Hopkins University shortly after he'd been um, come to the United States to teach. And he met this psychiatrist at John Hopkins of Native American ancestry. So this guy said, hey, you know what? We're having a peyote ceremony at my place over in Kansas. And so he said, would you like to come? And he invited him and he invited the other, the other psychiatrist who'd been, who'd been working with there at John Hopkins. So, so they arrived and they drove way out into the, to the plains of Kansas to meet the road chief, the elder who runs the ceremonies for the Native American church. Although the chief had previously agreed to um, include all of these visitors, well, when he got there, the other Indians, they were like, what? who are these guys? What are they doing here? You know, and, and so, you know, we all know the history, the anti-Indian prejudice, the monumental losses of, of culture and life, the, the genocide. It, it was still very fresh with these people in particular. So they... They were reluctant to accept these people at their peyote ceremony. The way they saw it was, oh, here they come to steal yet another, appropriate another aspect of our, and the peyote ceremony is really sacred. And so they said, we, you know, well, what are we going to do? Because this guy invited that there are guests reluctantly. So they, were, uh, they, they started drumming and doing the peyote ceremony, going into a sweat and everything. And there was this one guy in particular, one of the native guys, well, he did not want those people there, and particularly Stan, the, the psychiatrist. And he was glaring at him all night and just mad-dogging him and looking at him pretty angrily. And so I guess they decided it's just going to be this, this way the whole night. So finally, the last round of blessings the next day, this, the host psychiatrist said, I wanted to thank you for including us, for um, letting us be here, and I especially want to recognize Stan, the psychiatrist, and he said, because he's in exile right now, uh, because the communists are preventing him from returning, returning to his native Czechoslovakia. All at once, that guy who was so angry and so reluctant, he got up and his face changed, and he went and he jumped in Stan's lap, and he's just crying and sobbing, and he won't let go. And he says, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I was such a jerk, you know. And so um, they were like, what's, what's, what's the matter with this guy? And so as he wept, he unfolded his story, and he said, I was a bomber during World War II. And at the end of World War II, my plane bombed and unnecessarily destroyed the city of Pilsen, 
one of Czechoslovakia's most beautiful cities. Even though Czechoslovakia had been anti-Nazi and they had been forcibly occupied by Germany, so now the tables were turned. Not only did Stand and, and the Czechs never steal this guy's land, but he, a Potawatomi Indian, had helped destroy this guy's homeland. You see the irony. So he was a perpetrator, and Stan's people were the victims. This realization, it, it just tore him apart. He just couldn't bear it. And he was apologizing, begging forgiveness, and, 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 and saying, I don't know how I could possibly have misjudged you, misjudged this situation. Will you forgive me? As his heart thawed, you know. And then he says, you know what I've learned? I see now there can be no hope for the world if we carry hatred for deeds committed by our ancestors. I know you and I are not enemies, but we're brothers. All that happened a long time ago and was a time of our ancestors. Then he said, who knows? At that time, maybe I was on the other side. We are all children of one great spirit, one mother earth, and it is in trouble. And if we do not work together, we won't survive. So I'm going to end with a solstice blessing just for you. May you find peace in the promise of the solstice night, that each day forward is blessed with more light, that the cycle of nature, unbroken and true, brings faith to your soul and well-being to you. Rejoice in the darkness and the silence find rest, and may the days that follow be abundantly blessed. And so it is. <laughs>